This is Jeffrey Crevero, and I'm conducting an oral history with Dr. Annie Rifo. The interview is being conducted at the Sanford Museum in Sanford, Florida, on Thursday, March the 28th, 2024. Dr. Rifo, thank you for speaking with us today. Would you please begin by stating your full name and telling us a little bit about where you're from and what life was like for you growing up? Hmm. Um, my full name is uh, Annie Louise Rifo. I was named after my two grandmothers. Um, was born at the Navy base um, in 1951. Grew up on Sanford Avenue. My parents moved into the house at the corner of 7th and Sanford 45 days before I was born. Uh, so it's the only home that I've known. Uh, they were both teachers. My father eventually became a principal. Um, life in Sanford, for me, was fine. I wasn't aware of what was going on beyond Florida, and I find it ironic now that I was always afraid of Mississippi and Alabama, not realizing that there wasn't too much difference between Mississippi, Alabama, and Florida. Um, life was good. The neighborhood was close. Um, everybody parented everybody's children. So if you did something, say in Goldsboro, by the time you got home, it was already there, and you were going to be disciplined for it. Um, I don't have birth siblings. I have siblings that my mother adopted, and um, they were part of, of life, taking care of them, my parents, as they got older. Um, and that was, for me, kind of a, a cementing. Um, I don't I, I've listened to other people talk about Sanford. One man said in an interview that it was paradise, and I don't know that I would go that far. It, it was a good small southern town. There were places that I knew uh, I wasn't supposed to go. There's still some streets in Sanford that I have not been down, and it's just force of habit. That's the only uh, explanation I have. I can remember all birthdays were celebrated at the zoo. Um, I have pictures that go back ages of people who are still living here, uh, where we went there and celebrated birthdays. And that was usually, I don't remember going to the zoo for any other reason. It wasn't what it is now. You knew you were at the zoo, you knew there were, there were animals there. Uh, it, it was a new and different experience. And, you know, it's at the uh, corner, I think, of Commercial and Seminole Boulevard. Um, Sanford was Sanford. Uh, I don't, not old enough to remember when Jackie Robinson was playing. Uh, not really old enough to remember the Harry T. Moore thing. Dr. Starks was our doctor. He administered to everybody. And um, he was fabulous. He was a great diagnostician. Um, we were proud of him. He built his own building in 1953 that is still standing. And everybody, I mean, you knew Dr. Starks, and, and that was that. My parents were members of a, a social club it was called the Fonz Antonians, and it was a group of professionals. And they met, I think, on Wednesday, Wednesday nights, because Dr. Starks was off on Thursday. And that way he didn't have to get up early unless there was an emergency. So they all kind of catered to him. Um, it's a good place to live. What was your grandfather, uh, Herman L. Rifo Sr., like? Would you tell us a little about his life and his business? My grandfather was born on June 9, 1890 in Tallahassee. Um, his mother was an unwed mother. So you can imagine in 1890 the kind of stigma that that was. So when she came back to Sanford with this baby, she was no longer Phoebe Cruz. She was now Phoebe Rifo. And I have no idea where the name comes from. I've only found one other, one other set of Rifos, and that was a man in Jacksonville. I talked to his ex-daughter-in-law. He had already passed away. His name was Charlie Rifo. Um, my grandfather walked here with his, his grandmother, who was disabled. 
Um, he got here in 1899. Um, they, he was here from then until he died in 1987. Um, he was a tailor. He was the only tailor in Sanford for a while. He had a, um, a shop at the corner of Fourth and Cypress. And for whatever reason, he moved out and moved the tailoring shop to his house on Hickory Avenue. And I can remember one year he, he kept me because there were no daycare centers. And my uh, babysitter had moved, so my grandfather said he would keep me. And I can remember sitting on the steps and men coming in to buy their suits and to have their suits made by him. Uh, when my father went away to FAMU, he made all of his clothes. He tailored his, his pants, his slacks, his overcoat, his all of those things. So even though they were not rich by any stretch of the imagination, my father was wearing tailor-made clothes in, in college. He was a quiet man. For me, the the memory that sticks is the smell of cigar smoke because he always smoked cigars. And that was our birthday present to him every year. Um, my father would order a box of cigars and that would be for Papa. He was smoking his cigars sitting on the front porch. And we could tell if things were good between my grandmother and my grandfather, if they were sitting on the same side of the porch. If they were sitting on opposite sides of the porch, then you know you didn't want to stay long. He said, hello, how are you? And then you went back home because it was not safe. Um, he was the quiet one. My grandmother was a firebrand. She did not countenance any kind of disrespect at all. Um, she had no fear at all. And my father, my grandfather was just, he was quiet. He was a deacon in the church. Um, he went blind probably in the 60s. He was misdiagnosed as being nearsighted when really he had glaucoma. Uh, he adjusted without anybody um, giving him therapy. I can remember him getting water out of the refrigerator and putting his finger in the glass so that he could feel when the glass was filled up and he knew to stop. Um, he walked to church blind. He once got disoriented, and that kind of hit his self-confidence. But my grandmother talked him back up and told him, oh, yes, you're going to take the garbage out. This is not this is not an excuse. You have to take the garbage out, and you know to turn and to come back the same way you came. And he did. He got his, his confidence back. Um, he stayed in the, in the house. My grandmother um, died in 1976, and he came to live with my parents and eventually um, had to go to a nursing home, and that's where he passed away. We have a story that he was in the hospital, and one of the nurses um, didn't announce herself. And she grabbed his arm, and he cold coughed her. She had to go home, but it taught them a lesson. Announce yourself. The man's blind. He's old, let, you know, and, he, and he's hard of hearing. Come on, just, just do your job. It'll be fine. Um, but yes, he was, he was a soothing presence and quite a skilled tailor that he learned when he went to the normal school, which is now family. Um, <clears throat> and in his tailor shop, did he serve both whites and blacks? Yes. I found that interesting when I went in reflection that as segregated as a society was, president of the bank had no problem coming to Papa and having him make a suit. So yes, everybody came to, because he was the only one. And then somebody else came and, and my grandfather kind of took him under his wing. And I'm trying to remember his name, but I can't. Um, and then he began tailoring as my father, my grandfather began to wind down. And it's kind of the um, retail business kind of shifted. But yeah, he, he did. He had both black and white customers. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your parents? What were their names and how did they become involved in education? Hmm. Um, they were Herman L. Refo Jr. and Shelley L. Refo 
my father was born, he was born at the house on, on Hickory. My mother was born in Bristol, Florida, which is in Liberty County. Um, she moved here in 1920 when she was five. They went into teaching because that's where they were going to make the most money. It, it was purely economic. Um, my mother started teaching in Ocala, and my father started teaching in Williston. And World War II, by that time my mother was in the land. She was also the tennis and the basketball coach. Um, my dad fought in the war in the Pacific. And one of the stories is that he called when he got to Hawaii. He was on his way back home. And the principal went and got my mother out of class. And she went in the principal's office and took the phone call and said, How are you? You know, glad you're coming home. I have to go. My class is unsupervised. So I just, it amazes me. It also amazes me that they never took sick days. You know, my, my one of my, the, principals that I worked for told us, don't lie to me, just say I'm using a sick day today. And we often did, you know, we called it a mental health day, but they didn't. Um, they came back, they went to Midway, um, and they were young, so they got out and played basketball and played volleyball and ran with the kids, which was very unusual because most of the teachers were older and they weren't out, you know, roughhousing with the kids, so they became very popular. Um, my mother stayed at Midway until it was evident that she was going to have to teach me, and so she moved to Crooms. My father became an assistant principal, and he left Midway, and he went to Goldsboro, and eventually became principal at Goldsboro Elementary. So my grandmother had taught school for a little bit. She didn't like it, and eventually became, she was a cook, so she worked in the cafeteria, but uh, between the two of them, they went to FAMU as a couple, graduated, and then eventually got married, and my mother passed away in their 60th year. What was your own experience in education like? Did your, parent, <laughs> did your parents inspire you to enter the field? Or? Uh, I don't know how to answer that. Um, I, I liked teaching. I like to say that I think I was good at teaching. Uh, I just uh, had lunch with a student that I probably hadn't seen in 50 years. My oldest, my first class just turned 64. So, yeah, I, I, be, I became a teacher because my father told me I needed a job. And that was what I knew I could do. So I went back to school to get certified. I went to, to it was, you know, I think FTU then. And found out that oftentimes, whether it's divine providence or the fates, or whatever, you find your niche. And the, I think the only reason I stopped teaching was economic. I knew I needed to retire, and I knew that I was not going to be able to sustain myself with the retirement from teaching, so I went into administration. But even then, I still taught. Um, I would teach one class a semester. Um, tried to get it on the day that they had the dean's meeting so that perhaps I have an excuse not to go. Um, didn't work out that way. Though. She just changed the day. Um, but I loved it until, you know, you hit that skid where you, you don't want to do anything. And then that kind of passed away. And by that time, I was in administration, so I could just teach one class. I'd have one set of papers to grade. And that worked out well for me. I worry. Um, about education now, and I'm really happy that I'm not in it because the fact of someone telling me about my area of expertise and what I should or shouldn't teach because they're sitting on a bird just doesn't work for me. 
because I probably would have lost my job anyway during these times. But yeah, it was a good profession for me. Um, what can you tell us about? Was it your grandfather, your father that played baseball and was in the band in that? Uh, the pictures that you have, uh, it was Popeye, it was my grandfather. Uh, those pictures were taken about 1908. Um, he was in the band and in the in on the baseball team, which was a surprise. I, we found these pictures, and all of a sudden they were. You know, my mother had gone through them, and you can see her handwriting at the bottom. But I had no idea. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add or expand on? Do you have any final thoughts for us? I think for me, um, Papa was a very, very quiet man, but he was a man who instilled in all of us that there are some things you simply do not do. They're not acceptable. They're not part of being a member of, of humanity, that you have to be empathetic. My father's saying was there, but for the grace of God, go I. And he got that directly from Papa. He was, uh, I, I, I don't ever remember seeing him angry. I don't ever remember hearing him raise his voice. And I don't, I'm not saying that he didn't. It just wasn't part of my experience. One of the best memories I have is of the house at 614 watching my grandmother and my grandfather waltz because they were trying to teach me how to do it. And they realized that if they turn on the big radio, you know, those big ones that you see now that are in museums, and listen to the music and showed me, that would be the best way to do it. So in my mind, I can see them gliding, you know, across the living room and trying to teach me. Sometimes it took, some days it didn't. But for, to see them just being together was really something. Well, Dr. Rifa, thank you so much for sharing your time and speaking with us today. Thank you. This has been Jeffrey Crevero at the Sanford Museum on March the 28th, 2024.